So it's going to be three hours, so just relax and we'll go through it. You know, interrupt me if you have to ask any questions. I don't know if that is allowed. Rob didn't say that, but um, this topic is kind of, it's, um, it's a large topic. I mean, um, so it's hard to cover in an hour, so I put up a lot of slides, but we can skip through and, you know, if there's any topic of interest to you within that, we can talk about it. And it's something you see day to do, day to day in almost all of your patients that you hospitalize or in the clinic. So, um, so we'll try to cover the overview of calcium homeostasis and um, pathogenesis and etiology of hyper and hypocalcemia. We'll start with the case and disorders of bone metabolism and uh, vitamin D deficiency. And of course, we are not going to cover phosphate. I'll leave it up to Dr. Lederer. And um, renal stones, which is also part of what we do a lot. And um, we are in the process of setting up a bone and stone clinic at the VA sometime early next year. So, um, And also osteoporosis. I didn't go over the guidelines and the treatment, uh, because most of it, you all already know bisphosphonates, but I did uh, mention a few things about the new changes, such as the FRAX scoring system and the newer drugs available. Um, so we'll get started with that. Um, so this is a case, and if you all have been here in the more than two years um, ago, some of you may have seen this patient. Uh, we presented her at the Endocrine Society two years ago also. Uh, she is a 36-year-old um, uh, Caucasian woman who had history of Graves' disease, who had been going between emergency rooms and doctors for almost two to three years, um, untreated, mostly because of adherence issues and uh, other issues. So she finally presented to our emergency room in, I don't remember which hospital yet, but um, with um, near storm, she, her um, levels were pretty high. She had severe uh, Graves' arbitopathy when on presentation because she was a smoker. And she also um, had um, a large goiter, pretty, uh, maybe three to four fold, pretty big sized. And uh, she had all symptoms of uh, hyperthyroidism. So initially, um, we admitted her and brought her T4 levels down. And um, when we decided, uh, about treatment, we dis uh, realized that the goiter was too large that if, even if we did iodine treatment, radioactive iodine, it would not be one setting and she may need more than one or two sessions. On top of that, she was a pretty heavy smoker, pretty impressive Graves' orbitopathy. I wish we had the picture. So, and there is a lot of data from papers from the 90s and um, recently to suggest that orbitopathy can get much worse in smokers especially. Uh, with radioactive iodine treatment. And so at that point we decided, and she was a um, good surgical candidate in, in terms of a cardiopulmonary issue, so she underwent a total thyroidectomy, which is the other option for Graves' disease. Little did we know what we'll get into later during the thing. And I should mention this, that her pre-op calcium was fine at that time. Her vitamin D was slightly low, and she was on treatment. So. Um, her alk force was slightly elevated, which probably was attributed to the vitamin D levels. So six hours postoperatively, she has symptomatic hypocalcemia with a lot of neurofasciculation and cramps and everything. So uh, ENT, um, we, we are still following her at the time, and ENT calls us, and her calcium at that time was 5.9 with very low ionized calcium levels. And she was started on an IV calcium gluconate infusion which um, eventually, when the levels came up over time, we tried to switch her to oral calcium and calcitriol. However, it was very difficult because uh, even with very high dose of uh, calcium, um, as you can see, um, it was a supervised intake of elemental calcium up to 30 grams a day, um, four to six micrograms of calcitriol, and hydrochlorothiazide, 50 milligrams, that is to decrease the um, renal calcium loss. She, in spite of all this, she required a continuous slow IV calcium infusion. Every time we tried to stop it, her calcium levels would go down. And she spent about 82 days in the hospital that time. Um, 
And I heard that wasn't the longest from one of my colleagues in Chicago that they had a patient who spent five months. So I didn't feel so bad after that. Um, so finally, we were able to get her down. And um, let's see. so we uh, kind of uh, went through literature to look at what has been done, because she's pretty refractory with all this. And it was all supervised, monitored, and we looked at other etiology for malabsorption. She didn't have any signs of symptoms of it. Her celiac screen was negative, and um, she didn't have diarrhea or anything, other, other issues. We, ha we, we even had done a bone density. She had mild osteopenia, but nothing uh, very impressive. And uh, so uh, and a 24-hour urine cal calcium was hardly like it was pretty low, less than 50 milligrams. So based on some literature search, there were two or three um, reports, case reports, uh, from um, European countries about the use of foteo. It's unlabeled use of foteo, which is uh, teraparatide, 20 micrograms uh, twice a day. We, started, we uh, started her on that. And after we started, after a few weeks to um, almost a month later, she did, uh, she was, be, she was um, weaned off um, the IV calcium, and then she was discharged uh, with a calcium of 7.5. And the reason to discharge her on a lower um, uh, end of normal of a calcium is because we want to stimulate whatever parathyroid uh, that has been ischemic to try and kind of, uh, you know, restart functioning. So. Um, so clearly, this was a case of a surgical hypoparathyroidism. And one would hope that most of the time that they would start you know, uh, uh, slowly recovering, but sometimes it does not happen. And uh, uh, so uh, finally, she was discharged on Forteo, which is teraparatide, 20 micrograms. We were able to get a patient assistance for her. Um, I should uh, commend my fellow who graduated. She's in Houston now for all the work she did with us. Um, calcitriol, 4 micrograms, elemental calcium, 20 grams. Uh, one of my other fellows got it out of her pocket so that patient, you know, will not skip it. So cholecalciferol, um, I think it was about 8,000 I use, hydrochlorothiazide, and of course levothyroxine, 250 micrograms. And also magnesium, if she has hypomagnesemia, so magnesium oxide, 1,600, and ergocalciferol, 50,000 units weekly. Um, what has happened since then, we won't talk about it because that is another long story, but um, she did well, and I have a graph here, although I couldn't um, highlight um, this area. So I shouldn't have put the dates here, you know, for HIPAA reasons, but this is how she started preoperatively, and during the surgery, dropped all the way down the calcium. And then uh, with the infusion, she started going up. And around this point here, we started her, and a PTH, as you can see, right after her surgery was way down, telling that there was no PT parathyroid gland activity at all. And then it um, started going up, uh, and then we started Foteo somewhere around this point, mid, um, middle of, uh, you know, af about a month and a half later. Um, and then it slowly started rising, and she was able to get off the calcium and go home. And as you can see, the PTH levels did go up, suggesting that it is, uh, the Foteo activity, because a, a, a teraparatide is um, 1 to 34 um, analog of PTH, so you, it can be detectable in the assay, so she did um, end up having some levels, about 18 or 20 or so. So that's how she got discharged. So the reason I brought up that patient was because um, sometimes if you didn't know the patient's um, calcium vitamin D status, it can be a major struggle trying to, when they go through this kind of surgery and if there's uh, issues like this, to, trying to get over the hungry bone syndrome and the hypocalcemia. It was a very, very expensive um, you know, uh, case, uh, this patient spending almost three months in the hospital and all the tests involved and everything. So thinking back, we were thinking what we could have done different and uh, one would have been to improve her vitamin D status, you know, to improve uh, her calcium intake, um, all that. But however, sometimes it could not be avoided uh, because she did start with a normal calcium at that point. Um, so moving on to the calcium skeletal metabolism. So the calcium metabolism is very tightly controlled, very well controlled between the intracellular, extracellular um, 
uh, exchange. And it's um, uh, in the bone, uh, most of the calcium is in the bone. There's a very small percent in the uh, plasma. And, um, and it's uh, between the kidney, um, the GI tract, the kidney, GI tract, and the bone, it's very tightly controlled by several factors, which we'll talk about. So um, the regulators will be uh, phosphorus, magnesium, and other minerals. And the organ systems involve the skeleton, kidney, GI tract, and skin um, through vitamin D absorption. And several hormones, uh, PTH, calcitonin, 125-hydroxy uh, vitamin D, um, the PTH RP, FGF23, um, which uh, is very um, is linked with phosphate metabolism, and um, some other less known hormones, and also by gonadal and adrenal steroids and thyroid hormones. Um, as um, you know, we have spoken in the past, hyperthyroidism they can have higher bone turnover, causing hypercalcemia, and that is one of the mechanisms this patient could have had where she developed a lot of uh, hungry bone syndrome after the surgery. Um, and also other um, growth factors and cytokines are also involved. So total body calcium is about a kilogram. And as I mentioned earlier, 99% of it is in the bone, 1% in blood and body fluids, and um, in the cytosol, in the mitochondria, and other micros microsomes. It's regulated by all the pumps that are controlled in, within the cell. So the, uh, the calcium, serum calcium level is about 10 milligrams, um, 8.5 to 10.5 being the normal range. And the diffusible is about 6.5, and the non-diffusable is about 3.5 milligrams. Um, what is calcium important for? Well, pretty much everything, uh, cell signaling, neural transmission, muscle function, um, coagulation cascade, uh, cofactor for several enzymes, uh, cytoskeletal membrane function, um, secretion, including the insulin secretion, it's very important in the insulin secretion and biomineralization. Um, so what is PTH uh, role with the calcium metabolism? Um, so PTH is the major regulator of calcium. Um, so the PTH uh, has a calcium sensing receptor which is present on the chef cells, which is the lining of the parathyroid um, uh, uh, gland um, and um, yeah, the oxyphil cells and the Sheff cells, which are kind of uh, lining around the oxyphil cells. Um, so um, it, um, the, some of the other minor regulators are vit vitamin D, of course, and, um, and its receptors. But PTH is pretty much the major regulator of calcium, um, along with uh, uh, phosphate. So what are the actions of PTH? Uh, it stimulates uh, bone resorption, uh, which I'll go over a little bit later, um, the mechanism of it, which is the, um, uh, the mechanism behind the newer drug that we have available for osteoporosis treatment. And um, it also works on the kidney. It increases the calcium reabsorption, decreases phosph phosphate reabsorption, converts 25-hydroxy to 125-hydroxy-D in the kidney through 1-alpha-hydroxylase. One, one and it also um, uh, works, um, impacts vitamin D uh, by increasing the gut calcium absorption through a vitamin D-mediated action. It increases kidney renal calcium and FOS reabsorption and, um, um, and decreases hydroxylation of vitamin D. Um, So the parathyroid axis, both PTH and PTH-related peptide, which is PTHRP, work on the same um, receptors in the bone, uh, GI tract, and the kidney. Um, however, um, PTH works by endocrine mechanism, and the RP works through an autocrine, paracrine mechanism, which is uh, tumor-mediated a lot of times. So the PTH has the calcium-sensing receptor, as we spoke about. And um, it, uh, the PTH receptor is called the PTH receptor 1, which is present on the major um, organs. And, there, uh, and um, it, um, the mechanism involves 125-hydroxylase activity uh, through which you know, most of the functioning happens. So when you measure um, calcium, 
you're measuring, um, uh, you know, many times we always, everybody knows about the corrected uh, calcium. Um, we don't use ionized calcium as often because the assays um, involved with ionized calcium is the, the repetition or reproduction is not very accurate. However, there's a lot of instances, there are a few instances that we use it, but most of the time the calcium with the albumin, which is measured calcium uh, plus 0.8 times 4 minus serum albumin is pretty accurate. And um, recently our uh, lab director here, Dr. Miller, is very interested in the uh, uh, hydro, uh, vitamin D, he did do some research with us with vitamin D binding proteins a few years ago, um, uh, Dr. Winters and Dr. Miller. So we do have, um, when you order vitamin D, when you order PTH levels, they're automatically doing a calcium. Uh, that's how it is set up now. So it's more convenient than just independently getting a PTH and not, not knowing what the calcium is. So um, let's see. So what are the symptoms of hypocalcemia? Neuromuscular irritability, uh, paresthesias, laryngospasm, bronchospasm, tetany, um, seizures, uh, Schwastek sign and Trousseau sign, and uh, of course, prolonged QD interval on EKG is not a good sign at all. So uh, Schwastek sign, um, quite often, it is pretty helpful, especially when I see patients in the clinic who have autoimmune or um, hypoparathyroidism, before you get the lab results back, it pretty much um, gives you a good idea of you know, how, um, how well uh, the calcium levels are. So it's tapping on the face at a, a point just anterior to the ear, just um, below the zygomatic bone. And uh, a positive response is twitching of the ipsilateral facial muscles, which suggests um, neuromuscular um, irritability uh, caused by hypocalcemia. And the Trousseau sign, we use it less often these days. Um, it's easier to get a stat calcium um, uh, than, you know, do the blood pressure uh, cuff. But inflating a um, uh, sphygmo manometer cuff above the systolic blood pressure for several minutes, and a positive response, of course, is uh, muscle contraction, including wrist flexion and, M uh, and flexion of the MCP joints and hyperextension of the fingers and flexion of the uh, thumb um, and suggestive of neuromuscular irritability uh, again. Um, so common causes, we already spoke about hypoparathyroidism. Less commonly, PTH resistance, which is pseudo-hypoparathyroidism. I do have a picture of one of the patients. And hypomagnesemia, um, vitamin D deficiency, uh, is again a very less less well known less well um, identified in the past, but more commonly known these days. Um, especially one alpha hydroxylase deficiency VDDR1 and vitamin D resistance, uh, which is a syndrome which uh, we don't see as often here. Um, and um, malignancy, osteoblastic mets, uh, tumor lysis syndromes, and of course um, sepsis. And hungry bone, which is also what our patient had a combination of hungry bone, hypoparathyroidism, vitamin D deficiency, hyperthyroidism with increased bone turnover, rhabdomyolysis, medications, and uh, acute pancreatitis and toxic shock syndromes. So what are the medications? Um, plicomycin, so hemonc uh, floors mostly, fluoride, um, phoscarnet, pentamidin, which we don't use as often these days, but um, during my time of residency in the floors, inpatient HIV units, we use this quite a bit for um, PCP uh, pneumonia. Um, uh, phosphate, phenobarb, uh, bisphosphonates, sorry about the typo there. Um, especially one thing to note is um, more recently we are using a lot of IV bisphosphonates, IV reclast, which has been approved for osteoporosis, for Paget's. Um, and some other conditions, uh, glucocorticoid-induced um, osteoporosis, or GIO. So many of these patients, especially IV infusions, if you didn't correct their calcium vitamin D status, can have pretty severe symptoms, and they, it'll be, it's very unforgiving, believe me. Severe myalgias, um, severe cramps, and it can last up to several uh, weeks to days to weeks to months sometimes. Um, so it's very important when treating patients with bisphosphonates that they do get calcium and vitamin D along with the bisphosphonate. 
I'm going to skip this one. So one other interesting cause of hypocalcemia is um, the, uh, the, uh, poly, uh, the po polyendocrinopathy or polyglandular syndrome type 1, uh, which is more of interest for um, the endocrine fellows, but um, it is good to know about this. It is um, recognized in childhood itself because the infant presents with mucocutaneous uh, candidiasis, adrenal insufficiency, type 1 diabetes, um, and uh, the mutation is by the AIR gene, which is the autoimmune regulator gene mutation. It's autosomal recessive disorder. And uh, these patients have a multiple ectodermal dystrophy and multiple other um, autoimmune um, um, uh, presentation. This is uh, pseudo-hypoparathyroidism I just mentioned earlier. It is um, pretty interesting. We have at least two or three patients at the ACB clinic. Um, the PTH levels are extremely high and um, they are um, severe hypocalcemia, um, and they have this pretty impressive um, uh, absence of the fourth metacarpal. So if you do a plain film, you'll find that, or, or short fourth metacarpal. So typically obese, short stature, some mild mental retardation most of the time. So the deficiency of the signal uh, GS protein, it's called, binds which binds the PTH1 receptor to stimulate the adenine cyclase. That is the deficiency. So um, hypocalcemia, again, um, we already went through the differentiation, um, so I'm going to skip this part. Let's see. So anybody tell me what this syndrome is, the syndrome of hypocalcemia? So velofacial cardio syndrome. It's called the DGARGE syndrome? Anybody heard of that? They also have cardiac conduction defects, um, valvular issues, and hypocalcemia. Um, let's see. So, oh. not sure what happened here. Sorry. Okay, this is the case. So this is the second case. 26-year-old um, um, female who was noted to have elevated serum calcium on routine blood tests. Um, she's felt fine. Uh, menstrual cycles have been irregular. Um, no s history of stones or fracture. She's married, no children, no contraception. There is a family history of kidney stones, just like several other patients in Kentucky. So uh, her exam is pretty unremarkable. Um, um, except some mild galactoria. So serum calcium, 11 milligrams, phosphate, 2.1. Serum creatinine, 1, and rest of the chemistry is normal. And her PTH is 135, normal being 10 to 60. 24-hour urine calcium, 355 milligrams per day. And her bone density shows um, was normal. Um, and a prolactin, of course, is 110 nanograms per ml. Um, so... Any guesses on what the patient has? Rob, do you want to volunteer anybody or? That's fine. It's it's M E N. Those who have rotated with us can um, kind of know. We have a, a couple of families uh, that we follow. Um, and um, this is a multiple endocrine neoplasia patient. So. Anytime you have a young patient with primary hyperparathyroidism, it's very, very important to ask about family history and also make sure to look at other components of uh, MEN. Otherwise, otherwise it's, you know, it, it is a major um, issue if, if it wasn't, MEN wasn't recognized at presentation, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, so, um, so uh, primary hyperparathyroidism is the uh, most common cause of outpatient hypercalcemia. Um, about 85% is a single adenoma. 10 to 15% has uh, have patients have multiple adenoma, and 5% have hyperplasia. And this patient will probably fall in the 10 to 15% of the multiple adenoma because it's multiple endocrine neoplasia. So less than 1% have parathyroid carcinoma, which um, we have two patients with that. So uh, lab features, um, of course, elevated serum calcium, uh, like we noted. They are hyperchloremic, and they can also have a mild 
uh, metabolic acidosis. Uh, the pH is high and of course the PTH levels are high, although more often these days we are seeing normal, inappropriately normal PTH levels in the face of high calcium. And elevated ALKFOS, obviously related to the higher bone turnover, and uh, the urine um, um, uh, CAMP, we don't do, any, uh, do, do it on a regular basis. So then um, higher serum chloride to phosphate ratio, which is kind of something we don't really pay attention to. But if you did most of the primary hyperpara patients, the chloride to phosphate ratio would be greater than 30. Uh, chloremic metabolic acidosis, as I mentioned, the phosphate doesn't have to be low all the time. It can be normal because the phosphate um, metabolism is not as tightly regulated as um, the calcium is. Um, so in the past, in the 1930s, Fuller Albright, when first he described it, at that time we didn't have enough of these um, sophisticated labs. So by the time the patient presented, they would have extreme cases, they call them the stones, bones, and the groans, you know. Uh, they would have, 80% of them would have nephrocalcinosis. Uh, most of them would have severe neuromuscular weakness with um, uh, irritability, anxiety, depression, memory issues, um, bones meaning brown tumors from uh, osteofibrosis cystica. Um, um, and salt pepper erosions on the skull pattern. You could see it in some of the older plain films, and nephrocalcinosis, as I mentioned. However, in 1970s on, this all turned around then when we started having the automated analyzer, the serum chemistry. So we started uh, having patients get a BMP, calcium would be high, and they would be diagnosed earlier. So more often now, of, uh, about 70% of the patients that we get consulted on are actually asymptomatic. They don't have any of the symptoms. Of course, if you probe, they'll tell, yeah, I'm a little tired, yeah, I have memory issues. But most of them are asymptomatic. Um, however, they may have had a kidney stone or two in the past, but otherwise the symptoms are very limited. Um, and um, let's see, Oops, I think I'm backwards here, sorry. Okay, so what are the indications for surgery in asymptomatic primary hyperparathyroidism? Well, the initial NIH workshop was in the late 90s. Since then, there's been a revision in 2002 and again in 2009. I, I forgot to put the reference here, but it's by Belizikin's group in uh, Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism 2009. That is the most recent NIH recommendation. Because most patients now we see in the office have mild hypercalcemia. PTH may be normal or elevated. However, you need some guidelines as to who goes to surgery and who does not. And these are the guidelines. Serum calcium over 1.1 uh, milligram above normal range. 24-hour urinary calcium over 400, which used to be in all the guidelines, but in 2009 guidelines, the urine calcium has been taken out. Um, Creatinine clearance 30% below normal or GFR less than 60 if you can't identify other reasons for the medical renal disease. Um, the bone density T-score less than uh, negative 2.5 standard deviation any site, although in the past, in the 90s, it used to be only the forearm or the wrist, but now they say any site, which can be the hip and the spine. But we always include the forearm also. And I think a year ago, UFL did acquire the forearm. Before that, we had to send all the patients to Norton. But VA already has the forearm, so it's very convenient to do it there. Because the PTH um, uh, bone, um, um, uh, uh, most impact of PTH on the bone is the cortical bone, and the forearm bone has the highest amount of cortical bone, as opposed to your spine, which is mostly trabecular. And if a patient less than 50 years of age, um, doing the surgery has a long-term impact, you know, although now 50s is probably the new 30s, so I don't know if the 50 years age cutoff is really something, you know, to be discussed. So also surgery is indicated in those patients for whom medical surveillance is uh, neither desired or if you think they're not reliable or cannot be followed up on a regular basis. So these are the patients who go for surgery right away. 
because you see the patient, evaluate them, does a patient get surgery or not. The or not patients or the people you follow on a regular basis, six months to a year, yearly calcium, uh, PTH, bone density, and also urine calcium and reassess their symptoms, and based on what, what, what is found, then they get referred again. So, um, so, so this is, um, actually I borrowed this from one of our endocrine surgeons. Um, she trained at MD Anderson, so they use a four-dimensional parathyroid CT there, and as you can see, this is the uh, parathyroid gland right here. But here we have, um, our very nice state-of-the-art system EB scanner with SPECT imaging. So they have a four-dimensional tomogram, and this is a mediastinal um, um, parathyroid adenoma that uh, this patient has, uh, right next to the brachiocephalic uh, artery. So, so these are very helpful in locating the adenoma when you, once you decide this patient does have primary hyperparathyroidism. And uh, this is uh, another section of it, as you can see here, the, the parathyroid adenoma. Um, so once it's decided to do surgery, um, the, the surgery that is these days done, before it used to be the open um, cervical axis, but right now is the minimally invasive radio-guided parathyroidectomy, where the scar is very, very minimal. The surgeon goes in, already has a positive MIB scan, and they go in, uh, it's radio guided, and they take the adenoma out, and they do intraoperative PTH levels, which is available in a couple of other hospitals, but I'm not sure if it's in ULH. And then the PTH levels fall below 50%, that kind of assures them that the adenoma has been taken out. So, um, and the patient is out of the hospital in a day or so, and the scar is minimal. So patients do extremely well, and we have excellent surgeons, so we've had very good results with that. Um, op other options, if the patient can't go to surgery, either because they're not operable candidates or if it's opted to wait, hydration is very important and also diet is important. And some of the other non-FDA approved treatment for patients who are not operable candidates, uh, such as a 90-year-old patient that we are consulted on at Fraser, who had AFib, uh, um, CHF class four, so she wasn't somebody who could have been operated on. So IV bisphosphonates and calcium mimetic agents, um, sinacalcate or sensapar, and also less commonly used agents, uh, estrogens and SERMs, the um, selective estrogen receptor modulators. Um, so that's, um, that's pretty much about primary hyperparathyroidism. Of course, the familial syndromes, like the patient I presented, uh, MEN1, MEN2A, and um, familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia, which is a very important syndrome to recognize uh, before proceeding to surgery. And hyperparathyroidism jaw tumor syndrome, which is kind of rare. These are the patients who have parathyroid carcinoma and they present with fibroaceous jaw tumors. Um, and uh, these patients are quite sick, actually, and they have a mutation called the HPRT mutation. Um, then familial isolated hyperparathyroidism, and we have some of the largest families with, uh, uh, who are um, non-MTC, non-medullary thyroid cancer, familial isolated hyperparathyroid patients. So, um, so MEN1, the patient I presented, one in 30,000 uh, patients, 95% um, of the patients present with hyperparathyroidism. So MEN1 patient, even at the age of 10, can have high calcium. So there's, there's ways to screen these families starting from the age of 5 and then 10. What all do you look for? There can be about 25 different endocrine tumors that these patients can present with over their lifetime. So, uh, And uh, they need to be carefully screened and monitored um, so 95% of them will have hyperparathyroidism. Gastrinoma, about 50%, Zolinga elicins. Pituitary tumor, 25%, uh, prolactinoma. Angiofibroma, 85%. Collagenoma, about 70%. So the MEN, uh, hyperpara in MEN1, the onset is pretty early, like I mentioned. Even an eight-year-old can have a high calcium. Um, and multiple glands are affected, and this is the reason every time you see a patient whom you're diagnosed with 
multiple um, primary hyperpara is to determine that there is no MEN component to the primary hyperpara. And uh, you'd be surprised at how many patients you don't suspect, and then you screen them, ask questions, go over a family history, you'd be surprised. I had at least two patients in the VA who were in their 60s who presented with primary hyperpara who had a prolactinoma, and later we found out they had MEN. So multiple, multiple glands affected. Um, Post-op hypoparathyroidism is more common because they need extensive exploration. These are the patients where the minimally invasive radio-guided parathyroidectomy does not work. The MERP doesn't work. They need open exploration. So your endocrine surgeon needs to know ahead of time, this is a patient with MEN1. So they j just can't go out and take one adenoma out. It has to be multiple adenomas that need to be sampled, looked at, and removed. And they usually... Um, take three and a half out and t put half of it back either in the forearm or in the neck in the sternocleidomastoid. So, uh, successful subtotal parathyroidectomy followed by recurrent hyperparathyroidism is, happens in about 50% of the cases. So there is a recurrence in 50% even after successful surgery. So um, familial hypercalciuric, um, hypocalciuric hypercalcemia is an important entity to remember because um, in the boards, sometimes you get this question where the patient was sent to surgery and the calcium never ever um, you know, became normal. And then you find out later that the patient's family members, all of them have high calcium, have been asymptomatic. So that is um, FHH. And these patients have hypercalcemia. The PTH can be even higher than normal, but they are hypocalciuric. Their urine calcium 24 hours is less than 50 milligrams. Uh, per 24 hours. And the levels, like I mentioned, can be um, higher or lower, and they can also have hypermagnesemia. And um, what, uh, usually in these patients, uh, uh, calcium creatinine, it's called UP calcium over UP creatinine ratio, is less than 0 0.01, whereas um, in patients with primary hyperpara, it's more than 0 0.04. So that is kind of one way of um, ruling out FHH is doing a urine calcium, serum calcium, creatinine ratio. Um, so the infant, even the newborn infant in these patients have high calcium on presentation. So, um, And the gene testing is of a mutation in the calcium sensing receptor mutation. Um, and it is autosomal dominant, um, so that's why the, you know, all family members have it. And it's loss of function mutation of the calcium sensing receptor. Um, so that is about primary hyperpara and FHH. So secondary hyperpara is something we all commonly see almost every day in our practice. Um, typically, it's most commonly related to vitamin D deficiency, which is more prevalent in our um, uh, population here in Kentucky, almost 50%. Um, usually, patients are asymptomatic. So they have a high PTH, but the calcium is normal um, or low. and um, if um, phosphorus is elevated, you kind of attribute it to renal. If phosphorus is low, then other causes of vitamin D deficiency should be sought in these patients. So uh, prevention is vitamin D replacement, and of course in renal patients, phosphorus binders also. And um, in CKD, these patients, um, intractable hyperparathyroidism, a secondary hyperparathyroidism is treated with Sensipar or Sinacalcate. And very rarely, um, these patients may need surgery. However, most often, you always explore causes of other secondary reasons for elevated high, uh, PTH levels. So the next entity is the humoral hypercalcemia of malignancy, or um, um, that I think we had a few cases over the summer um, in the medicine service in the VA. Um, most common uh, malignancies are squamous cell CA, uh, lung, cervix, head and neck, esophagus, um, renal ovarian, breast and bladder cancer, and HDLV um, for lymphoma. Um, and um, uh, multiple myeloma, breast cancer, and uh, leukemia also. Um, so those are about um, PTH dependent and um, humoral hypercalcemia. PTH independent hypercalcemia, which is PTH-related uh, peptide mechanism is uh, ectopic PTH secretion, and these are um, 
um, sorry, uh, PTH independent hypercalcemia is 125-hydroxy vitamin D mediated. These are mostly granulomatous disorders um, and uh, lymphoma. Um, and these patients uh, do not uh, respond to um, bisphosphonates. You need to give them high-dose steroids. I mentioned PTHRP by error. Scratch it out. Uh, so it's 125 vitamin D mediated. So the macrophage uh, in lymphomas and in uh, granulomatous disorders, there's extra renal production of 125D through 1-alpha hydroxylase, and that is how these patients become hypercalcemic. Um, and um, commonly seen in tuberculosis, histoplasma, cocci, crypto, blasto, no cardiosis, berylosis, disseminated candidiasis. Um, Wagner's, uh, uh, Borreliosis, and uh, cat scratch disease, leprosy, which we rarely see here. But, um, and um, those patients, uh, I think I don't see sarcoid here. Um, and these can be, uh, the mechanism is that um, these patients, there is um, the granuloma produces uh, one alpha, uh, uh, converts 25 to 125 one alpha hydroxylase mediated, and that increases the uh, uh, calcium levels, and they present with high urine calcium and high serum calcium. And it's PTH independent. The PTH is turned off. So PTH levels are typically low or undetectable, and 125 levels are high or high normal. If they have kidney disease, they don't have to be necessarily high. They can be high normal. And uh, 25 may or may not be high based on their uh, 25 and calcium status. And um, these are the patients we have to look for granulomatous disease and occasionally lymphomas, um, which sometimes can be pretty difficult to uh, find. We recently had a patient with Hodgkin's um, um, with uh, this mechanism. So uh, just an algorithm for hypercalcemia. Uh, measuring um, serum total, and they say ionized here, although most of the time we use corrected calcium. If it's elevated, uh, clinical evaluation, um, good clinical evaluation, including and also uh, a chemistry panel and ALKFOS, and measuring PTH, of course. Um, if so, PTH normal or high PTH dependent hypercalcemia, so um, uh, we already went through the algorithm for that. Then PTH independent. Um, uh, um, mechanisms, occult malignancy, such as um, uh, chest, uh, looking for myeloma and mammogram for, you know, uh, breast causes and CT and abdominal CT. And um, so if, if none can be found, uh, we can, we should go into the other algorithm looking for granulomatous diseases and everything. And if it is found, then treatment of the primary malignancy. And if it is PTRP related, these patients do respond to bisphosphonates while the malignancy is treated. Um, let's see. Leave. This is um, this is a similar um, algorithm looking at um, you know different etiologies, and um, let's see. okay. There's one. Um, slide that I missed earlier, I need to talk about that because it's very important when you screen these patients with hypercalcemia. Um, let's see. Okay. So medications causing hypercalcemia. When you see a patient with hypercalcemia in the office, always look at the thiazide diuretics, uh, discontinue them, and prove that the calcium is high in spite of discontinuing. And most patients who have thiazide-induced hypercalcemia do end up eventually having hyperparathyroidism. And also uh, theophylline antiestrogens used for breast cancer, um, the ER-positive um, 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 ER positive, uh, cancers, the aromatase inhibitors that we use commonly, and astrazole. Um, there are several case reports that, that they can cause mild hypercalcemia. In fact, I had a patient with that. And um, at that time, it hadn't been reported, but later on, I found that that was the reason. And when the anastrozole was stopped later on, uh, her calcium did come down. So that is a very important um, uh, reason. Um, uh, 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 list of uh, evaluation of medications is very important. So other causes of PTH-independent hypercalcemia, immobilization, milk alkali, 
um, Paget's disease, um, um, uh, IV nutrition, um, medications we talked about. So, um, so that pretty much uh, is primary hyperparathyroidism and um, hyper and hypocalcemia. Um, so a word or two about um, Paget's. So a 70-year-old woman who comes with progressive hearing loss of the left ear, right knee pain, and she has enlarged calvarium, uh, and the bone scan shows a very high uptake of left skull and pelvis. And more than the bone scan, the plain film does show the thickening and the activity. Um, and of course, it's a localized disorder of the skeleton, and there's a wide range of skeletal involvement. And um, there's advanced, uh, there's interface of normal bone with osteolytic focus of Paget's, and uh, it is, it's a chaotic or um, confusion in bone remodeling. That's what happens. So there's a lot of excess osteoclastic bone resorption, and so the bone is laid in an in a abnormal fashion. So um, the, sorry about that. So the hallmark is usually isolated, uh, isolated elevation of ALKFOS in a patient who has normal vitamin D levels. And um, uh, rarely do we use the urine hydroxyproline, but sometimes it is used to um, look at uh, response to uh, treatment with bisphosphonates, but urine hydroxyproline is, can be considered as one of the treatments. We do not use the other bone markers, such as the NTX, CTX, and osteocalcin on a regular basis, although in late major bone centers they do use them. But more commonly, we just uh, look at ALKFOS and symptoms of the patient. If it's a weight-bearing bone, um, or if the patient is to have any surgery, such as a knee replacement, and that knee has pagets, or if, it, if they have neuro, um, uh, some kind of compression symptoms related to spine involvement of pagets, hearing loss and heart failure, and also cranial nerve palsies, those are all indications for treatment. Um, and you treat for three to five months, repeat the ALKFOS. If the ALKFOS comes down, you stop treatment. So that's the way it is done. So are we, do we have more time? Um, what is the time? We can keep going? Okay. Okay, so this is another case I wanted to talk about, which will kind of segue us to our next uh, topic. And this is a 67-year-old uh, male who underwent one of the older surgeries, which we hardly ever do anymore, of bariatric surgery, and that is this one here. Duodenal switch, biliopancreatic diversion with a duodenal switch. It's hardly ever done anymore, but it was a surgery which was commonly done in the 80s and 90s. Severe malabsorption, severe restriction and malabsorption, as you can see. Pretty much the stomach is almost not there, and the duodenum is completely, completely bypassed, as opposed to the Ruin Y, where um, duodenum is not bypassed, but the stomach has, um, you know, duodenum is bypassed a little bit, but um, there is a loop uh, of a small intestine going. And so that is like the next more malabsorptive. The more recently we have done the sleeves, which there is no bypass of the duodenum, but the um, greater curvature of the stomach, a sleeve is created where it is kind of bypassed. And then the more commonly used um, procedure right now that we have is the adjustable gastric banding, or lap band, more commonly known as. It's very simple. It's a laparoscopic procedure, so it's pretty simple. However, the weight loss is not as effective as some of the others. But the uh, bone mineral metabolism and other problems that go along with the older gastric bypass are not present, and it is adjustable, so patients love that. Anyway, this gentleman, unfortunately, went all the way to Tennessee and found a surgeon who would do this for him, and this was done in 2004. So since then, as you can see, he lost quite a bit of weight. I didn't put the percent ideal body weight that he lost, but he lost quite a bit. Along came with that severe, severe, severe vitamin D deficiency. His vitamin D levels were so low, we had to give him 50,000 units twice a day, every day, along with calcium. And in spite of that, his urine calcium was undetectable for two to three years. 
his bone density um, at the hip, the spine was okay. The hip was negative 1.9 um, uh, in uh, about four years ago. Two years ago, it did progress down to negative 2.1. At that time, he was given bisphosphonates. And a um, year ago, within a year, it progressed some more. However, during this time, within the last two years, he had multiple, multiple fractures of weight-bearing joints, the hip. So we would say, okay, maybe the actinal didn't work, so let's move on to IV reclast or IV zolindronic acid. And then the gentleman would come back. By the time we set up the reclast, he would have broken another bone. And of course, with bisphosphonates, you cannot give them for about 12 weeks after a fracture. So we would wait for the 12 weeks, and when we set up, by then he broke his kneecap. So he had three fractures within a span of six months, I said, okay. At that point, we measured his urine calcium. It was still quite low. And, um, and um, after that, we switched him to Foteo because it seemed like it would be a safer option, which is teraparatide or PTH analog. And we had to give him 15 grams of calcium citrate to bring his calcium in the urine up to a decent level, such as 40, 50 milligrams. So it's very important when we are evaluating patients that uh, you look at the calcium, um, the, the history, because many patients fail to tell you about these surgeries that they've had done. Um, and, uh, and the older bypass surgeries are more malabsorptive. It's very important to remember that. And, and three fractures in a year is pretty debilitating. But this patient recovered pretty, very nicely, and he has had no fractures since then. And we haven't measured his um, um, uh, bone density since then, but it'll be in this next six months that we'll be doing it. But he's doing much better now, and his PTH has come down. So that segues us to our next um, thing, which is the vitamin D, which is a hot topic. When I did um, vitamin D search a few, few weeks ago to see what else is new, I got about 100 publications within the last year or so. So much, so much data on vitamin D. So. Um, anyway, um, so vitamin D, 7-dehydrocholesterol uh, hydro is absorbed um, through the skin, so that produces, and that along with the dietary sources of vitamin D2, which is plant-based, um, we get cholecalciferol, which is D3, and that undergoes 25-hydroxylation in the liver, so you have 25-hydroxycholecalciferol or 25-hydroxy-D3, and that one alpha hydroxylation in, in the kidney with PTH, which is a PTH mediated mechanism, uh, one alpha 25 uh, dihydroxy cholecalciferol, uh, which is the active vitamin D analog. So activity is based on this. However, when screening, um, one screens um, using um, uh, 25 hydroxy D, and we'll talk about that a little bit. So what is um, vitamin D deficiency? Um, so roughly, can anyone tell me how many of you all would be vitamin D deficient? What percent in this room? Any guesses? Everyone. You're almost right. <laughs> Depending on how much time you spend outside, outdoors, which as residents, I, I bet hardly any time, and we don't live in Florida. so. So pretty much 50 to 80 percent, depending on the population you're looking at. There were some studies uh, five or six years ago looking at um, elderly population nursing of about 80 to 90 percent severe vitamin D deficiency. In temperate climates, up to 50 percent. Even in tropical areas with the sunblock and everything, it's about, you know, it, it's up to from 30 to 50 percent. So. Um, it's pretty high prevalence depending on where you're looking at. And also some, there's some seasonal variation, of course, but uh, like I said, with the sunblock and everything, it's very hard. Um, so what is uh, considered a deficiency? Um, 20 nanograms per deciliter, 25 hydroxy vitamin D, and insufficiency is 21 to 29. The reason I brought up vitamin D was there's been so many different conflicting uh, uh, issues about screening and treatment, and recently this summer, the Institute of Medicine and the Endocrine Society together have published guidelines. 
I can't go through the whole information, but it, it is in um, Journal of Clinical Endocrinology this summer, I think June or July uh, publication, uh, and it's very detailed and it goes through all the recommendations. Um, there, I put it here, I guess, yeah, 2011. And it pretty much mirrors the IOM guidelines, um, although there's some kind of you know, issues with um, some of the treatments. But um, So what is the recommendation for screening? Well, you don't screen everybody who walks in. You screen only at-risk individuals. Well, who are at risk? Well, that is a topic of discussion. However, in this picture, this is, there's a lot of data in here, but um, at-risk individuals are pretty much patients who have had history of rickets, osteomalacia, which is kind of rare, osteoporosis, any non-traumatic fractures or fragility fractures, higher risk of fall, such as elderly patients and patients who have other neuromuscular dystrophy immobilization syndromes, because as you know, their bone mass can be lower. And also patients who have um, malabsorptive syndromes, such as Crohn's disease, Whipple's, uh, CF. CF um, has major vitamin D deficiency because of the exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. Um, celiac disease, which is more common than we think it was. Um, liver disease, and what is not in here is what the patient that we talked about, the bariatric surgery patients, and also patients who have had radiation enteritis. And um, um, so, um, and other group of patients are uh, patients who are on medications such as the heart therapy for HIV, uh, rifampin, steroids, of course, anti-epileptics, especially the older anti-epileptics, um, uh, such as the phenobarbital, and also patients who are on Questron or cholesterol, which is a bile acid binder because vitamin D undergoes uh, the metabolism in the liver, so those patients also have to be screened. And of course, end-stage liver disease patients and renal disease we talked about. And um, patients' obesity, any patient who is over a BMI of 30 has to be screened for vitamin D deficiency because they, that is a high risk. And what are the different ethnic groups that have to be screened? Well, um, African-American adults and children, there's a very, very high uh, incidence of vitamin D deficiency. And also Hispanics. Hispanic groups, children and adults, um, pregnancy and lactation, that is the other group of uh, high-risk individuals. And um, less known or less substantiated, however, talked about is type 1 diabetes. Because many times type 1 diabetics have associated celiac disease, which is unknown. And um, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, because rheumatoid patients do have uh, bone-related uh, bone uh, issues. And, um, and there's a lot of data on type 2 diabetes and vitamin D, and there's a lot of studies looking at insulin secretion in type 2 diabetes and with vitamin D. However, for the sake of guidelines, it's not something which has been really pushed for. But of course, most of your type 2 diabetics are also a higher BMI. They're obese, more than 30. So obviously, you end up screening them. Um, and also um, vitamin D and hypertension. There's, there was a major Framingham study um, in circulation about three or four years ago, which uh, created a lot of excitement looking at vitamin D deficiency and hypertensive heart disease. And that has since then, vitamin D screening has been effectively done in a lot of those patients. And more recently in the last year, there's been several publications looking at vitamin D asthma and other lung diseases, especially asthma. So, um, so pretty much, I'm going to say all patients based on this, but uh, however, the guidelines are there. And I already mentioned the high-risk groups here, um, and of course, hyperparathyroid patients, very important to screen for vitamin D. You don't want them to have hungry bone syndrome after you remove the, um, the culprit parathyroid. Okay. so. The one in red is very important. 20, when you screen a patient, you use 25-hydroxy-D. Now, in ULH, we have our own assay now. It's run two times a week. It's the uh, liquid chromatography. It's ELISA, actually. It's ELISA, and it's a pretty standardized assay, and it gives you 25-D2, 25-D3, and a total uh, D2, D3 together, which is the total vitamin D levels. 
you do not use 125D for screening purposes. Uh, 125D, otherwise known as calcitriol, because in the VA there is calcitriol. You do not want to use that if you're going to screen a patient. 125D is used once you have a patient who has <coughs> renal disease or you're looking, screening them for PTH independent mechanisms of, of hypercalcemia. So for screening purposes, it's 25D. What are the available assays? Radioimmunoassay, HPLC, and the mass spect assay, which Quest has, which is very well standardized. And uh, I mentioned to you in U ULH, we have our own assay. And they do save some of the blood, so when you get the 25D, and if it's pretty low, you can call back and tell them, hey, can you run a PTH or can you run something else? So, so it's a pretty effective method of doing it. So what are the treatments available? Well, the cheapest treatment is sunlight. And there have been a lot of studies by Dr. Hollick in Boston area looking at how much sunlight exposure um, increases your vitamin D. And of course, we don't want dermatologists coming behind us telling us, you know, increases myeloma risk, uh, I mean melanoma risk, but about 10 minutes in the, in the peak sunlight uh, exposure every day pretty much gives you the vitamin D required on a daily basis. Um, so what is the recommended daily supplementation for healthy uh, population? Remember, this is healthy population. Infants, 400 IU. Um, children and adults, 600 IU to 800 IU. Adults over the age of 70, 800 international units to 1,000. They do also have upper limit of normal that you can give, which is up to 2,000 or 5,000. I didn't put all that information in here, but it's available in the guidelines. To prevent falls, what is the vitamin D? The data shows that minimum 800 to 1,000 IU to prevent um, falls. There's been a big study which was done in nursing home patients. Um, and um, just kind of to know how much vitamin D that you give every day, how much it increases your level. Well, if you give 100 IU every day for four months, your level can go, by, go up by 0.5 to 1 nanogram, which means if you had a patient who had 10 nanograms and you want them to get to the goal of 20, which is, you know, beyond deficiency, then you need about 1,000 to 2,000 international units per day. Now, remember, this, uh, the daily supplementation is in healthy people. Patients who are the risk, high-risk patients, such as malabsorption and the bariatric patient that I presented, the levels are much higher, like, like 50,000 units in a loading dose for eight weeks, such as, okay? And a um, few, just a couple of slides on osteoporosis. Um, I'm not going to go into major details, but sorry about the typo here, but what is new in the last two, three years is the FRAX system, which many, many of you may be familiar with. But in the past, we only looked at DEXA scans. We looked at at-risk populations, screened them, and uh, which is uh, women over the age of um, postmenopausal women and um, uh, men over the age of 70. And we did not, if they were below the negative 2.5 magic number, they were called osteopenic. And uh, depending on what the other risk factors was, they were either treated or just monitored with calcium and D. However, in the last three years, um, the University of uh, Birmingham, not this Birmingham, but in Sheffield, um, UK, had um, come up with this, um, um, uh, you know, FRAX scoring system, which is a very nice, uh, sorry, you can't see it very well, but this is the website. And uh, it is a very detailed system. It gives you the 10-year risk of hip fracture and non-vertebral fracture. Um, and uh, you just plug in the numbers. It includes a family history, personal history of smoking, a BMI of patient, um, also looks at ethnicity, especially here where we see a lot of um, um, uh, multiracial, different um, nationality patients such as Asians and Somalians. It gives a, a very nice um, racial tool. So you can click in the numbers and look at their 10-year ten, ten risk. If the 10-year risk of hip is greater than 3% and 10-year risk of non-vertebral is greater than 20%, uh, then those patients become eligible for treatment irrespective of their DEXA scan scores. So that is something which is new in the last two, three years. And the FRAX model has been incorporated in several bone centers and, um, and uh, 
when you use that, you end up treating a lot more patients who would, would not have been treated if, if we didn't have the FRAX system. So, um, and the next new, um, next uh, new um, uh, recommendation was in the last three years was uh, before there was no guidelines for treatment for healthy men, but now uh, men over the age of 70 are, um, we are allowed to screen them for osteoporosis. And then um, there's a new kid on the block in terms of drugs. I don't know how many of you all have used the denuzumab, but it is a monoclonal antibody, and it's a new class of drug used for osteoporosis. We have the SERMs, we have the estrogen, we have calcitonin, which is very weak, uh, bisphosphonates, oral, monthly, IV, um, and then we had the Forteo or teraparatide, which there have been very good studies, but it's limited use only up to 24 months. You can't use Forteo more than two years. So this is a new uh, drug. It's denuzumab. It's Prolia, and it's also called, I don't know how you pronounce this. I call it Jiva. Um, and Jiva is the form of it which is used in uh, bone mets in patients with solid tumors, and the Prolia is approved for osteoporosis. It's uh, once every six months, and it's an injection um, given in the office, 60 milligrams. And um, the mechanism is, uh, for looking at the mechanism, we have to go to this slide here. So this is osteo um, um, bone resorption, mechanism of bone resorption. So the bone resorption is very tightly regulated in a healthy individual, where the osteoblasts uh, recruit through PTH, I don't see PTH here, but PTH kind of helps it to recruit because PTH is involved in bone resorption. Um, through PTH, recruit the rank um, ligand um, to the rank receptor, which is on the osteoclast. So the osteoclasts are produced, so osteoblasts recruit the uh, rank through the rank ligand, and that is then um, recruited into the bone bed to cause bone resorption. However, any time there is one biologic action, there's always something else to kind of control it or negate it, and that is the OPG or um, osteoprotegrin right here, which is a decoy-soluble receptor, which um, uh, uh, kind of negates the rank ligand action. So if, if uh, rank, when um, OPG binds to um, rank ligand, then osteo, um, um, osteoclast activity is decreased. So there's no bone resorption. Whereas when rank ligand uh, binds to rank on this, then the bone resorption happens. Well, this is where denuzumab comes in. Uh, denuzumab is a rank ligand antibody, so it prevents bone resorption. It's a monoclonal antibody. It, um, it binds to transmembrane rank ligand, so it, it prevents rank ligand from activating its receptor rank on the surface of the osteoclast precursors. So it's pretty very specific, highly specific. Uh, one would, uh, the tri two trials which um, uh, did the studies on this is Freedom and Defend. I won't go into the details, um, but it's all in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's very interesting trials. One has to read about it. But um, the advantage of Prolia or denuzumab over the other drugs is that it can be used in renal failure. Bisphosphonates, if the um, GFR is less than 30, you cannot, but these patients you can. Well, you always have to know about the side effects. Other than the known side effects of uh, hypocalcemia, etc., cetera, uh, one has to remember sometimes it can cause nasty cellulitis or skin rash. That is the most well-known. So if you have a patient who doesn't have intact skin, chronic venous insufficiency, such things, you want to make sure that's all taken care of before treating the patient. And also the less well-known info on antibodies causing other uh, down regulation of other uh, you know things and causing tumors or pancreatitis that is all not well known however at this point it is available as an option down your list of osteoporosis medications so that pretty much completes the talk does anyone have any questions sorry i went through a lot of it too fast uh huh it's on the web. <laughs> uh huh. Let me tell you this. In the last two years, since it became so hot, um, in the last two three years, uh, the labs have kind of uh, cashed in on that. 
So they have what is called as the fatigue panel now, which every one of my patients who is seeing somebody outside of the university setting has a fatigue panel ordered, and that includes cortisol and vitamin D. So you can imagine what kind of trouble I get in every time a patient walks in. So, and as I said, in Kentucky, there's, you know, because of the valley and the sunlight exposure and the higher BMI and most of those risk factors that I looked at, your patient will fit in one of them, either BMI or diabetes or anything. So it is well worth screening them for it, you know. Uh, most of them, and then you can go over their diet. If their diet didn't include most of the vitamin D supplements, perhaps they are deficient. If somebody is doing fast food galore all the time, then obviously they're going to be vitamin D deficient. So, and one thing to remember, a trick to a successful treatment is to have them take their vitamin D with the biggest meal or the most um, you know, fatty meal that they do, which is mostly dinner, because it's such a fat-soluble vitamin that it's better absorbed. Some, uh, some people kind of say it's not really true, but I have found that to be very helpful you know, after doing this now for the past few years. Yeah. Yes? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about four months. Yeah, about three to four months. I mean, there are some patients you may want to check sooner, such as the, my guy with the bariatric thing. I did end up checking sooner, but I checked his PTH also to see if the PTH did come down. The reason they use the 20 and the 30 as the cutoff is, and that is the time that the PTH starts going up with secondary hyperparathyroidism. That's why it was arbitrarily used as a number. So, I mean, based on several large studies. 